In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. On Friday morning, my sister sent me a text. It was a link to the televangelist Kenneth Copeland, who invited his viewers to press their hands up against their television sets so that he could heal them of COVID-19 right through their screens. Other churches, he said, are canceling worship services out of fear, but you can come on down to his church and he will give you a thermometer and if you have a fever, he will heal you on the spot. In a time of unfolding crisis, when we are afraid and feel powerless, it is then that we look for a savior. Even thinking people who should know better are vulnerable to the woefully misguided or willfully misinformed, the charlatans and salesmen who seek to profit from disaster. So this morning at Christ Church, as we adjust to this strange and suspenseful moment, and a novel landscape of leading worship online, I am here to preach to you the following good news. We have a savior. We don't need to look for him because he is looking for us. Christians are incarnation people. We are Jesus people by definition. And our faith teaches us that in Jesus, God is right here with us. And that God's presence and purpose tend to be revealed most powerfully when we are in trouble. So I'd like to look at our scripture readings for this day, the third Sunday of Lent, and ask for God's word to be a lantern to our feet and a light to our path for our Savior Jesus Christ to seek us and find us, and for the Holy Spirit to breathe into us the truth of who we are. Our Hebrew scripture from Exodus begins, appropriately enough, in the wilderness with a large community of people in crisis. After making their way out of slavery in Egypt, the Israelites are headed for the Promised Land, but they are not there yet. They are in the desert places, struggling to find even basic resources. They are exposed and vulnerable. They are thirsty. They believe they are dying of thirst. It was easy to trust that God was right there with them when the Red Sea miraculously parted and when manna fell from heaven, but that was then. Now they feel abandoned and frightened. Is God with us or not? They complained to Moses. Why would God save us only to watch us die? They get angry and they take it out on Moses the guy with the direct line to God who led them into this mess, and Moses, fearing for his life, begs God for help. Notice how God responds here. Not in some miraculous display of divine power like a supernatural thunderstorm or a freshwater geyser busting up from a sand dune. God doesn't heal them on the spot. God chooses to act within the confines of the natural world and inspire the human community to access its gifts. There is water in the rocks. The potential for salvation is at hand. It's just a matter of discovering it. God gives Moses the direction he needs to lead the people out of their paralysis and panic and blame and to help them remember who they are. The thing is, the people's satisfaction with such revelation and salvation is only ever temporary. 
the Israelites will continue to argue about who's in and who's out, who's beloved and who's a sinner, and where the heck is God when bad things happen to good people. Their words express the same quintessential struggle of scared and suffering people of faith throughout history, including us right now. Like them, we may find ourselves asking, is the Lord among us or not? I think it's a fair question. I don't think asking it necessarily makes the people of God less faithful. After all, the Psalms are full of eloquent and agonized cries to God for help. The prophets and Jesus himself beseech God for rescue, for remedy, for answers. But something happens when we shift the emphasis of the question slightly and ask, is the Lord among us or not? In other words, are we a community through which God is able to work and heal and be known or not? In this community, are we recognizable as people activated and empowered by the wide embrace of God's love? Is our relationship with God alive enough to, substantial enough that we're even asking the question, is the Lord among us or not? One possible answer may be found in an unlikely source of enlightenment. The Samaritan woman at the well you may remember the story from John's Gospel. Jesus is on the way to Galilee, and he decides for some reason to go through Samaria, an unfriendly, even dangerous territory, instead of along a kinder, gentler road. There's a long-standing fracture between Jew and Samaritan. It's the result of a kingdom divided centuries earlier over, among other things, where and how to properly worship God. So that original community of God's people wandering together in the wilderness has long been broken apart. Yet Jesus heads straight into Samaria, and he chooses to cross every ethnic, gender, religious, and social boundary to initiate a conversation with this woman, an unnamed, uneducated Samaritan whose identity brands her as a despised and ritually contaminated outsider. But this action of Jesus is actually not even the surprising part. The surprising part is the encounter itself. What begins with a drink of water ends with a shattering of convention and one woman's astonishing conversion from loathed outcast to messianic witness and evangelist. Give me a drink, Jesus asks the Samaritan woman. Like the Israelites in the wilderness, he is exhausted and vulnerable and thirsty. But unlike the Israelites, he is not helpless. He asks this woman, a stranger, to quench his bodily thirst so that he can give her what she needs to quench her spiritual thirst forever. And in this exchange, the unnamed woman comes alive and begins to question Jesus on theology, probing him about his relationship to the great patriarchs of the faith, about religious conflict and right worship and eternal life. She's She's not deterred by Jesus' mysterious proclamations, nor is she mortified by his comments on her personal life. Her focus remains on Jesus as she grills him on every precept of Samaritan doctrine, and little by little, her suspicions about his identity are confirmed. I know the Messiah is coming, she tells Jesus at last, I am he, 
Jesus replies, uttering for the first time the divine name God spoke to Moses from the burning bush, I am. Into this ordinary life, on an ordinary day, comes the revelation that those powerful forces that split us apart as nations, communities, families, are being transformed. Jesus has been sent by God not to condemn the world, but that the world may be saved through him. And the Samaritan woman cannot wait another second. She leaves her water jar without a backward glance, just as the other disciples left their livelihoods and their families to follow Jesus, and she runs to her people with the good news of Jesus' astonishing inclusiveness and promise. The Samaritan woman at the well becomes an active, ardent collaborator in God's dream for the reconciliation and reunion of all creation. This dream of God, it comes into being not through flashy miracle or magic trick, not through grandstanding and not through coercion, but through relationship. And the Samaritan woman doesn't hoard this discovery for herself. She runs to tell her neighbors. As we move through a season of Lent like no other we've known, let us follow that running woman. What impacts some of us directly affects us all indirectly. Let us remember that we are in this together. As the director of the World Health Organization said last week, this epidemic can be pushed back, but only with a collective, coordinated, and comprehensive approach of us all. This is not the time to give up. This is a time to pull out all the stops. We are all in this together. And so we ask ourselves, is the Lord among us or not? Yes. The answer is yes. Our Lord is among us. Our Savior is right here, activating and empowering us to transform social distancing into brand new gifts of connection, creative life-giving ways of loving, serving, listening, and living the truth of who we are. God of this present moment, we pray that as you seek us out and soothe our frantic hearts, you will also reveal in us your dream of a beloved community through which you will work and heal and comfort and be known. Amen. Let us join together for a moment of silence and reflection. 